So obviously the film's with you in the city. Could you tell us about your childhood? Yeah, I grew up in Spring Garden Alley, which is just up around the corner from here, from the Theatre Royal. And I was born in 1948, which was, I suppose, a grey, miserable time, or it seemed miserable. I mean, I wasn't miserable, I wasn't unhappy either. But there was that kind of sense that you did what you were told, uh, you wore Sunday clothes and took them off when Sunday was over, and you had a bath once a week by the fire, and you, had, you were respectful, and uh, you watched your P's and Q's, you ate your cabbage, if you didn't, you wouldn't, you get it the next day, and all those kind of things. And if your mother or father were displeased, uh, they would probably threaten you. And your mother would threaten you. Your father comes home, he'll bait you. And your father came home and threatened you with his belt or whatever and whatever. And uh, there were wooden spoons. And my father did take off his belt. But if you told someone today that your father hit you with a belt, uh, they'd almost be considered that it was abuse and I should sue my parents. I had lovely parents in many, many ways. My mother was too religious, too spiritual, too holy, and all those kind of things. And my father was probably funny. He could take a drink and he'd been around the world. He, he actually went away on a ship. My father was from Ferrybank. He was known as Tommy Murphy or Tony Murphy. And he played hurling with Ferrybank. He came back to play hurling. But he got off a ship. He, he, was, he was shoveling coal in a coal yard called McCullough's in Ferrybank. And with my, own fa- with, with my grandfather. And ships were coming in and he went away on one of them. Actually went away. And he came back to play hurling for Ferrybank. And the city manager in Wharf was a man called Raptus. And he got him a job to play hurling in Ferrybank. Small world where people took care of people because of sport. And I mean, I, I, when I was a kid, I used to get hurleys in the post from Tipperary, sent in the post with pheasants. Like they would, my, my mother's sister lived, married a man in, in Tipperary, in Feathered in County Tipperary. And they would send food stuff down and bags of potatoes and pheasants, which stank. But you couldn't eat a pheasant until it was nearly hanging, you had to hang it on the wall for as many days, and, uh, and a hurley. I got hurleys in the post, and I played hurling in the park. And my father ran leagues, and, uh, you know, and I was going to play for Ferry Bank, and I probably didn't, you know. <laughs> and, and <laughs> growing up in Spring Garden Alley, I mean, did, you, did you play around that area? I played, we played on the street. Uh, the guards had come around, uh, we played hurling. Uh, we had played in kind of street leagues. We had really, I mean, if you weren't careful, you'd be hopped off the wall with a stone dash wall under the nuns. There was a green canopy, a green tunnel going from the Lady Lane nuns' convent into the garden. And if the ball went into the garden, you really were in trouble. You had to go into Una Neri's house and climb over her wall. She'd let you in and climb over the wall and get the ball back, you know what I mean? I went into Cook's, who were on the other side. But if your mother knew you, if the nuns came down to your father and mother, or they told a priest called Father Hallinan, if they came down to your house, you were in deep trouble. I mean, serious trouble. Bringing, I mean, nobody today, if you brought the, the drug squad or the guardie to your door, would seem to be something terrible, you know what I mean? And you wouldn't want to do anything about it. But imagine if a priest who wasn't making a house call came to your door to give out because, Mrs Murphy, I'm afraid your leam was in the orchard. Oh, mother of God. Now, there was no point in explaining that if you robbed apples, and we did, God, we did rob apples, and your mother made tarts out of them and made apple sauce out of them and all those kind of things, but that was okay because you weren't caught. But I remember the black doctor, Dr. Dabro, caught us in down by Water Park and sent for the guards, and a man called Nevins who worked in the pumping station in Water Park where they pumped the sewage out and the water in. He stepped in and intervened, but brought me home. And Father Hallinan, a priest from the cathedral, arrived. And the deal was almost that I'd be an altar boy. Oh, my God. I, and I wasn't clever enough and I wasn't brainy enough to know that if I had been an altar boy, I would have had money. I would have actually had serious amounts of pounds, shillings and pence. But I was, didn't see that. I wanted to be wild or mad or... Uh, we made, we made street carts with wheels and bits and pieces. We were in the bogs behind the railway station in Railway Square with guys like Flemings. Ted Fleming became a priest afterwards. Uh, Dominic Fardy, uh, the Gleasons, and we were in mad, st- we were in castles. I, I went to school in the Manor, in Manor CBS, and there was castles 
Bugs O'Reilly, I shouldn't say Bugs, Pat O'Reilly, but he's known everybody as Bugs. His mother fed us many and many a time, gave us a sandwich. Oh, not necessarily a sandwich, but bread with butter and maybe sugar sprinkled on it, you know. And Frank Coughlin, the late actor, lived up around the corner in Castle Terrace, you know. And um, we used to play in the castle. We were ch chucking bricks off the castle and sods off the castle. And, and Dominic Fardy had a castle in Mendicity Lane on the opposite side of the road, next to the railway station. They were mad. Absolutely mad times, even though, yes, I would say it was a great time and it was a restrictive time and you, you went to Mass and you, you prayed and you prayed in Latin and uh, you read your, you got a nice fancy rosary beads and everything and you were brought around to all your relations for your communion. I was brought to Ferrybank to meet aunts and uncles that I didn't know particularly, but they were on my father's side and my mother didn't have that many relations on her side. And you'd be going to people's houses and they'd be kissing you with whiskey bread and they'd be giving you, dipping their finger in Guinness and giving you a taste of it. And your mother disapproving, tis, 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 but you did it and it was, you know, and I, 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 I must have been my communion when I first tasted whiskey or, or Guinness, even though I'd taken a pledge and I had a pioneer pin. Not only had I a pioneer pin by the time I got to secondary education, but I had a, fa I had a, a kind of a fauna thing and I had a, a, an Irish language Somehow it looked like a badge rather than a circle of it, but I had a fauna as well. And I went to the rails and I danced Irish dancing and I, I went to mass and I prayed and I was... I, I, worked, I mean, I, I find this ridiculous and it's, it's almost as if I'm believing that, I, that I, I had a previous existence. I was in the Legion of Mary once and believed in it and thought that... They, my mother was in the Blue Army. My mother was so delighted that I joined the Legio Maria and I was up in Lady Lane and that I was going out to visit sick people, people who were dying in Arkeen and we were making visitations and praying with them and going to... I, 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 in some way in the back of my head, I believed I was a legionary and a lovely man called Paddy King who came from up in Prayers Knock somewhere and he took care of everybody and he called for you and he reassured your mother everything would be wonderful and... I, I wouldn't go anywhere without rosary beads. I might have a hurley in this hand, um, a 64-page comic in the other hand, and somewhere a rosary. Have you got your rosary beads? Yes, ma'am. Have you got your Russian boots? Which are Wellington boots because it always rained. <laughs> so you had to have... I mean, I had marks on the backs of my legs from the black of Russian boots. You know, and that, that was the way it was. Was it a wonderful childhood? Probably wasn't. Did I have rickets? Probably I didn't. Uh, I was fat. And I, I was short-sighted, so when I was in school, there was a time when I was probably referred to specky four-eyes. And I, I made an awful mistake. I um, sang a few times, and the Christian brother had you up in front of the class singing. And I used to sing things from the movies, but my mother would be working in the kitchen, would be singing. The donkey, my mother taught me the donkey serenade. She read me comics, and I must have cost her a small fortune then to buy me the dandy, the bean or the eagle, uh, the bees or the topper, and read them to us. Uh, I mean, I've made most of my living in my life through teaching, through words, writing, reviewing, uh, all that kind of thing. And my mother taught me to read. And I wasn't taught to read in school. And I mean, I don't mean that that the Christian brothers were bad people. I do not mean that. Uh, it taught me to read and taught me to read the hard way. And it also means sat you down and uh, worked on your English and, and gave you words and examined your spelling. Oh, were you academic in school? Oh, I was. Oh, God, I was swat. God forgive me. Even though I wanted to play Hurling, then I did play Hurling. Because Hurlings were coming in the post, and your father was involved in Hurling. And my father had been to America, and he told the stories in bed. And I thought they were real. I thought my father fought wars, and was in Guadalcanal, and in Korea flying aeroplanes. And I, sometimes I wonder why I'm attracted to narrative and story. But I grew up with people telling me stories. And we walked by the riverside. My father was really in love with the river. He had two boats. We actually had two rowing boats on the river when I was from six years of age to maybe when I was 14, 15, 16. My brother rowed in the boat club. And I, was, I, just couldn't, I wasn't interested. I, I did want to play sports, but I knew I wanted to be a writer. or I, I wanted to write poetry. And imagine when you told people in primary school that you wanted to write poetry. She said, Jesus, it was the kiss of death. <laughs> no, matter, no matter how your ego, and I mean, ego wasn't being an issue, I wouldn't have been aware that I had an ego, but the sense 
that you would tell someone that you wanted to be a poet, and your mother would be saying, that's lovely. You know, that's good. Eh? You know? And your father saying, but there's no money in it, boy. And did you tell people? I did. Sure, I, 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 was, I was in primary school when I started sending off stuff. And, you know... So what was your first one published? I, I'm not really... I, I used to write articles for the evening press. Uh, like people write to the letters page and they paid people for the letters page. So I used to write letters to the letters page and I got paid for them. Stupid things, you know. I, I, I don't, I mean, I hadn't thought about that when you asked me. I mean, genuinely, uh, you've opened a, a door in my mind, uh, so to speak, you know. And uh, I, I started to read more. I, I read a lot and I was a little swat. And you ever go to the library? Yes. And I remember Miss Fanning in the library. And the library was, had a reading room downstairs where Garter Lane 1 is today. And going in there and reading newspapers. And you did because we didn't have a family. We were lucky to have family newspapers. We'd have a newspaper once a week or something like that, you know. And your father read the horse, took the horse racing and something like that. And your mother took something else. And we, I think my mother got Ireland's own and some other, like, Woman's Weekly, uh, when that came in, which was kind of a small-ish book, when, because, only for knitting. My mother knitted all my jumpers. Why the most horrible, you know? <laughs> I mean, it, it was awful to think that your mother knitted everything, and if, if the sleeve went out, it was patched. My mother darned socks. I mean, I would fire away socks because today, because they look baggy or they look fluffy or, uh, you know, or they didn't seem to be right or the heel looked wrong. I mean, we had to have them darned and repaired and replenished. And uh, I don't mean I had no arse in me trousers, but if I was stupid enough to have no arse in me trousers, it had to be repaired, you know what I mean? And what did, what did the librarians think of you? Like, you were quite young. Ah, I was taking Dylan Thomas out before I was 15. I was reading Thomas Merton who was a Cartesian Trappist monk. Uh, I, I, I must have been kind of spiritual. <laughs> Today I'm not. Uh, I, don't mean I, do, I don't mean that I do people down, but I don't believe in religion or anything else like that. Uh, if somebody, has to, if somebody says to me, you pray for somebody, I'd say, Margaret, when you go to Mass, Margaret's my wife, will you pray for them? And Margaret would pray for them and everything else. And I would say to people, I'd send you good thoughts. Uh, I think when I'm dead, I'm dead. And that'll be the end of it, you know? But uh, I, I was... If I joined the Legion of Mary and everything, I must have been really a holy Joe as well. That, you know, that there's a, a past you don't really want to... <laughs> you don't want to go back there, you know what I mean? And I probably shouldn't be saying this. <laughs> That's the way it is sometimes, you know? And then when you went to secondary, then, what was that? Uh, oh, I got a scholarship. God forgive me. I got a council scholarship. I got a corporation scholarship, like the Earl of Cork or something, to go to secondary school. And... Uh, what does that mean, like? Uh, it paid for my... I wouldn't have had a secondary education otherwise. I genuinely wouldn't have had a secondary education if I didn't get a scholarship because we were... My father was a dustman, and I'm not... I don't mean dustman is a bad thing. I don't mean something people sneer. I mean, we were working class. We were working class. It didn't make any difference. Uh, I've always been working class. You have to work for a living. You have to work for a living, and it shouldn't be such an issue of stasis or... And when I was a college lecturer, I didn't see that. It was uh, as something different. I was still working for a living and I reared a family and everything else. But uh, it was that sense that um, that's what you did. You know what I mean? You, you, you went out and you did, you did things, you know? I did. So you got the scholarship to go to secondary Yeah, and I enjoyed secondary school. I was good at Irish. I was, a, I was definitely a SWAT. I mean, I really, maybe it's fear. Maybe I couldn't let my mammy down. Maybe I, you know, there's a whole range of and things. And everything was Oh, yeah, it's called Long Gaelic. And then and, uh, there was a famous incident. I know you don't want to go into that now, come oh, on. Yeah. I mean, that's been, that's been oh, horsed, yeah, sure. that's been horsed around it often enough, you know what <laughs> I mean? Uh, okay, so when did you first, you actually got a book of poetry published? Yes. Uh, with, I, I got a new Irish writing award. I mean, back in the 70s, early 70s, uh, I was published by the, I was published by the News and Star probably first of all. But I, I won a new Irish Writing Award for poetry. I, I had a dog, you know, the, the, the Hennessy Brandy dog. And I left it, when I got married, I left home, I left it with my mother. And my mother polished it with Brasso, or not Brasso, with silver. The stuff you polish silver with. And the dog wasn't totally silver. 
the dog was plastic with silver coating and my mother polished the silver nearly off it. And when she died, I took it back and it's now in the hall. If you come to our house, there's a wooden heart by the door that I got from the salvage shop because it's Elvis Presley, it's rock and roll, it's stuff like that. Sorry, I do stray, you know. And uh, there is the dog with his back, uh, the plastic exposed on his back. I tried to get it recoated. I brought it to people and everything else. But I was lucky. I got a Hennessy Award for poetry uh, in, a, in, a, you know, in a year when, um, oh, really significant writers got it that time, you know. Uh, I was probably the least significant of them. But you're also uh, you were as such that you were probably the first published writer in Waterloo. No, I, wouldn't, I would not have said that. I don't think that that's true. Of that age? Of, of that, that age, age, yes. I've been a young guy who didn't use punctuation and uh, I was on the radio and fellas came to interview me and I, I was so politicised at one time. I mean, I remember protesting about Mayor Daly coming to Waterford when he was bequeathing stuff to Capo Quinn and Dungarvan and that because of what happened in Chicago. Uh, and I, I was angry about the Vietnam War and God, I can't understand the kind, I can't understand the kind of person I was as against the person that I am today. Uh, I don't mean to say I was a rebel, but I didn't, I didn't go gentle into that good night. If I had felt something, I said it. I was melting. You inspiration for a lot of younger writers coming up after, like Sean Dunn. Yeah, I, so I, I, you know, I started Waterford Writers Group at a time when Sean Dunn came, Philip O'Neill, a chap called Brennan, Michael O'Reilly, who died in London, uh, different people, and they came to our house. And, you know, we got published, and I did... I, I typed. I, I had a typewriter. I worked in Cherry's Brewery in the summers. I always had a second job or a part-time job or something, which probably my mother or my father got for me, you know what I mean? And working in a brewery was magic. I came out pissed drunk many a time, as a t you know, in my later teens, and I saw armies of, of clerics up on the wall, up on the roof of the Dominican. There's, four, there's three statues over the Dominican. I saw them multiplied, and they waving at me, saying, hey, you know what I mean? I fell down the stairs once. Came all the way down the stairs, and there was a wooden panel at the end of the door, and my feet went out there, and I was bleeding, and my mother fired me out. And I went to live with my aunt in Ferrybank, my Aunt Esther, my father's sister. And my mother only brought me back when she found I was giving Esther the money that I should have been giving her. So she brought me back. Properly chastised and everything else, and I'd never drink again. But I had to go back to Cherries the next summer because I liked the barley wine, my mother liked the money, <laughs> or whatever, you know what I mean? Uh, I don't drink today particularly. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I was a pioneer at one time, I presume, and I, I did all the right things, you know, but that's not, I was a hippie, I remember being a hippie, I remember, I remember getting people to bring me clothes from the UK, I had bell bottom, I wanted to have the first bell bottom trousers in Waterford, I didn't have, but I, I didn't see anything wrong with having bell bottoms that were curtain material, and getting them, my mother wanted to take them in a bit because there's too much and everything else, and having uh, orange <laughs> orange trousers. I had orange trousers. Excuse me, I'm going to blow my nose. I had orange trousers. I had yellow shoes. And I was tripping along quite happy. And friends of mine would be in London. I had a friend called Mixie Collins from Rice Park, who's John Collins' brother. And uh, one, of their children, one of their brother's children is a lighting guy in Garter Lane. Uh, Lippy Collins today, you know. Uh, he would be in Green Park and different places in London. And he would go up to poets like uh, McSweeney, who was a Liverpool, who was um, not a Liverpoolian, a Geordie poet, and visit him and send me stuff. And uh, it was just. Uh, okay, let's go back to the bit because remember you were saying that when you were uh, in Spring Garden Alley, when when did your first time coming into this theatre? Uh, as a kid, I, there was a cinema here. Back in the, there was a period, somewhere between the 30s, 40s and the 50s, there wasn't a theatre here anymore. There wasn't an assembly hall or anything else like that. Uh, it was still, a, there, was, there was a variation. It was a cinema and it put on shows. And it kind of put on travelling shows, magicians, uh, variety shows and stuff like that. But it was a cinema owned by Lawrence and Martin Breen. 
and they had it up into the 50s. And I would sneak in. People, like I'd sneak into the Colosseum. I'd sneak into the Savoy. You couldn't sneak into the Regal because you had to go up a metal uh, fire escape to get in. So you couldn't sneak in there, but you could sneak into the Col if you were quick enough and fast enough and whatever, you know? And I hung around here. I mean, uh, uh, if you lived in Springer, I was just, what, less than 100 yards away. Uh, you hung around and there was an opportunity, you went in the door. And when this place became a theatre, uh, it was bought, uh, the council were going to get rid of it in some shape or form, uh, develop maybe the council offices or whatever. And people like Larry Fanning, Joe Mile and other people, uh, and people I can't remember their names, and I should, but I don't, uh, got together to save it for a theatre. And I remember back in the early days of the opera, and the opera had, it was 50 years of opera and work. And before that, there was a grand opera. And I, I, when I was, I, when I was but somewhere between nine and 12, I was an altar boy in the grand opera. Larry Fannin kind of went out there and said, if you're going to hang around here, come in here and hang around. You know, or something to that effect. At least we know what he's robbing. <laughs> He never said that. I don't mean that he said that. No, that kind of sense, bring in the young fellow, for God's sake, and make him do something useful. And there I was, an altar boy in Cavalleria Rusticana. And they were singing the Easter hymn, and there was guy investments, and there was English singers and everything. And I was mesmerized. When it's my turn to walk off, I was... Lights. And at the same time, I was in Failing the Skull, or Failing the Skull in there. Um, and I saw a photograph of myself of Faden the Scholar up in the library in Waterford where Paul Clancy did a thing about Manor School boys. And there I am as a pirate. And was that thing on here as well? No, it was up in the large room. Okay. Well, it was here sometimes, but I remember being up in the large room when which was the municipal theatre in that stage. And my mother made me a pirate's hat uh, in white with red dots. And she walked the town, as she would say, I walked the town for you, boy, to get you red sequins. And she sewed those sequins into that hat so I'd have a better pirate costume than other people. So, I mean, the so there, must have been, there must have been show business in the family somewhere that I wasn't aware of, you know what I mean? With the opera, though, was that aimed at kind of... That was grand opera. Yeah, but would that be like, we say... I mean, Waterford was very kind of merchant-class town. Yeah, like, Willie Watt and people like him set up Waterford music. And, I mean... It's fair to say that when we have people talking today about uh, the Three Sisters and the bid for European capital of culture in 2020, Waterford, more than 50 years ago, were bringing in German musicians, Viennese musicians, people who were fleeing a war and whatever, and they were playing in the large room or you know, places like that. There were German refugee musicians down by the courthouse, Ernest Gabler, or Gabler, taught people violin and other stringed instruments because they came from the war. And in a sense, De Valera brought them to Ireland, you know, brought people to Ireland who had musical skills or whatever because they, and, and mathematicians. And all, I mean, Waterford had a greater, back more than 50 years ago, Waterford had grand opera. It had Felina Scullina. I, saw, I, I remember Tops of the Town starting here. And if there wasn't the Theatre Royal, if there wasn't, or it was the Town Hall then, I mean, it wasn't the Theatre Royal or that kind of notion, I mean, the Theatre. It was the Town Hall. And you went down to the Town Hall, and the Town Hall was on the Mall. And that's where it was. But it was part of the people's life. You know, I know it's a truism to say it was the people's theatre, but it was. And early Tops of the Town was mad. I mean, there was, the show lasted an hour. Uh, there was an hour of an interval, because one set went out, another set came in, and I mean, you wouldn't be out of the theatre, you wouldn't be out of the place at nearly 12 o'clock. And people sat all the way up to the gods and enjoyed it, and there was just that, it was a different world that I was a kid, probably nine or 12 maybe, singing cowboy songs in Failing the Skull, in a, or singing pirate songs with an Irish song like Graw McCree, McCrushkeen, and a wooden. Uh, tin mug in my hand and a sword that my mother had made. Not my father. My mother had made me. She didn't. She went up to a guy, a carpenter in the spring guards called Teddy Foley and he made me a sword, a wooden sword. To be in the skull. So I mean, like, I mean, would you say Tops Town was really important for the time you were getting people onto the stage? Yes. People, because Tops Town picked people from communities, from factories, from jobs, etc., etc. And it was, it was a wonderful idea. Tops of Town, actually, when it was called Tops of the Town, started in Waterford, the De La Salle committee who wanted to build a school in Stephen Street 
the people who were involved in that, uh, and I presume most of those people are dead now. And they were also on the committee here. There was a mix of Mount Sign people and Dallas Al people on the committee. Larry Fanning would have been a Mount Sign person, and uh, I just can't just can't offhand think of the people's names. Uh, but there was that kind of sense that the theatre would also get a use, that Tops of the Town would save a school, would build a school, and would also keep a theatre open. And that was important. I mean, people did want entertainment. The, the cinema was here, and people went to the cinema, and there was the Savoy, the Regal, the Colosseum. All that's gone. What about the pantomime society? Uh, there were lots of pantomimes. There were different pantomime societies. Like way back in time. Way back, yeah. Tommy Fitzgerald, uh, Roger McGrath was a comedian. Uh, Joe McGrath's brother was a famous photographer. I remember coming. My mother, my mother brought me to the panto. And my father, you know, the, my mother more than my father was. My father was away. He worked for Irish Shipping and he worked abroad. And, uh, you know, we had, obviously we had more money because of that. But I was brought to the panto. And I remember howling and sitting there and shouting. And I would probably be as amazed by lights today in the theatre as I was 50-something years ago. That is, I mean, maybe that's what makes me a theatre critic. I don't know. I mean, I don't know why. Nobody came along and said, Lee, we want you to be a theatre critic. Someone said, would you write about this or whatever or whatever or whatever, you know what I mean? I was probably writing promotional stuff, sending it to newspapers anyway. So fellas, when they wanted, when somebody died or did something, should Lee Murphy will write that for you, you know what I mean, or whatever. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like there was an ad in the paper, wanted, critic, wanted. You know, that what, isn't the way the world is. How did you actually get involved then? On the other side, like uh, I joined it. I was involved in plays. I was involved in the WDS in the early days, building scenery, uh, painting flats, nailing flats up at Henrietta Street. Uh, I, I, I didn't know any better. I, it's not like that I had some kind of, I woke up some day and I sort of said, wow, I, I want to be a star or I want to be an actor or I want to build sets. And then I, because I read a lot, I wanted to direct because by directing, I got a chance to do the play that I wanted to do. I mean, that was important. I remember... What kind of play? Oh, weird ones. Uh, kind of... Kind of plays with people with bags on their heads. Social realism. Uh, Beckett-y. Uh, odd sort of plays. I mean, I, I had notions. Oh, God, I must have had notions. But I, I remember in the panto, sitting up there, dressed as Statler or Waldorf, and Pat McAvoy, who's the theatre critic for the News and Star, were the best of friends, and we probably we were for rival papers, was probably still the best of friends in many ways. We'd slag one another off, but that's part of the process. And the public expects you to kind of slag off the opposition or whatever. But we played Statler and Waldorf, and we used to howl down a bit, hey, call yourself, a, call yourself an actor. And people in the pit, we, we almost took over the panto by stupidity, because we were, you know the way your ego soars, and you get that kind of sense. We are better than the people on stage. I don't mean that we were better than the people on stage, but sitting up there and the lights on you, you did think you were. And we had libbed and everything else. And I, I, in the pantomime society that's there today, what of a pantomime society, the Denny Corker and the people that were there, I was on the committee of the Theatre Royal. I was the secretary of the Theatre Royal at one time. I actually got to be a secretary. I actually got to be on the committee, to be a decision maker if there was such a thing, even though Larry Fanning was probably a one-man show. I don't mean that in a bad way. His kind of philosophy was, if you want to do it, you do it yourself. And he was probably right. That if you wanted things done in that time, you did it yourself and you knew it was done. And he ran the Grand Opera Society. He was also involved in hurling and sport and played for Mount Sinai and played for Waterford. Larry Fanning is an was an amazing man who bridged generations, who bridged sport and literature. He collected the plays and books of George Bernard Shaw. I remember Larry Fanning reading me prefaces up in his house when I went to collect the keys or get a letter signed or something, that a man would bring you in and read you George Bernard Shaw. That's weird. That is, we have this kind of idea that the past was not as literary or literate or as intelligent or whatever else. It was there. It was still a great time and a difficult time, but people understood things. You know? the musical societies that water became famous for afterwards, would yeah. you see them as coming out of Tops of Town? Or were they... they came out of Tops of Town. There was always... They came out of opera because there was an opera festival. There was over 50 years of light opera in Waterford. 
And that gave, De La Salle were there before that, but it gave rise, rise to Mount Sinai or the Edmund Rice Society. And it gave rise to younger societies, like the Brian Flynn's and all those people who were involved. Jamie Beamish came to De La Salle College shows and everything else. It was, an, it, looking back, it was an amazing time. Maybe today is an amazing time as well. And last night at our town, I realized how amazing another generation can be. But uh, it's, looking back, kind of colors things. It, it, uh, it always seems that we always had summers and we sat on the beach and your mother made tea and you sent you up to the shop to get hot water and all those kind of things. Now you come home for the chips, you know what I mean? If, if the queue was too long and for more, you just come home and get chips and, or you made chips or you made chips. We make chips at home now in an air machine. You pop them in, there's no fat, and they're cooked by some, probably cost two, 200 euros or something, but uh, the world has changed, you know what I mean? Uh, there, it'd be wrong to think that there weren't people writing back then, and there were. And can we just ask too about the early uh, Arts for All? Yeah, I, I got involved in Arts for All, again on the basis that I wanted to see things done. Uh, I actually got involved with Music Moves before I got involved with Arts for All. But I knew Jim Nolan, I knew you, Jim O'Mara, uh, just that l people who were involved, like mind, and Arts for All seemed right. There was a need for an art centre. It was happening everywhere else, you know what I mean? If you were reading Time magazine, you were reading uh, international publications, you're reading publications, out of international news out of London, which was looking at uh, rock and roll, pop music, you know what I mean? That w you couldn't have been a child of the 60s. I know people say, if you can remember the 60s, you weren't there. I do remember the 60s, and I do remember beat poetry, and I do remember the sense that you could go out and entertain, and uh, arts, uh, I mean, arts for all is a real bubble. The sense that People got together and we did a play for a month on, the str on green areas in Waterford. Every night for maybe 20 nights and something else. And there was Jim Nolan involved in that, Clodagh Welch who was an RTE. Uh, you could have been involved in it indirectly. Uh, just so many people over the years that came and went. We went to the Kilkenny Arts Festival. We went all over the place, but we went to housing estates because we believed that, Arts for All believed that, genuinely believed that the arts is not an elitist thing. I would probably think today that art is more elitist. I do think that sometimes, but I would still fight against it. I would argue against myself. Art should be the people, if we pay our taxes, the councils who spend that money, the taxpayers, should have a look at democratizing it more, opening it out more. Uh, arts festivals have become elitist. Kilkenny Arts Festival at the moment, 13 performances of Bach, uh, three separate performances of Goldberg Variations at probably 50 euros a pop. For fuck's sake, that is wrong. That is not the way. At least if you're going to charge that, give away at least 10% of the tickets to, I don't mean ordinary people, average people, and give them a chance to go and see it. I don't, be, I don't believe that. Uh, you know, people should have an art shoved down their throats or forced, like we were in school or something, you know what I mean? Like there was a generation at school kind of, well-meaning teachers kind of felt that uh, they should be exposed to more theatre and more culture and more singing and it has good points and it has its bad points. And, and sometimes socially, socially and socialistly minded people kind of believe that music would be good for the masses, etc., etc., etc. But... I, I, I bought into Arts for All as a project, as an idea. Uh, we did stupid plays, we did plays in different plays. I remember going into pubs. I mean, who in their right mind would take a play by Yeats to a, a pub in Listogan, where the fellas in the pub were still throwing darts? And then someone said, Shop, Labour, come on, ah, come on, they're the young fellas. They're our own young fellas. His father was Tommy Murphy. He's on, he's, he's on the ash car, you know what I mean? And they kind of grudgingly, are you finished yet? But we just thought it was... I remember being in a small pub in Arundel Square with Jim Nolan on my back in a Yeats play. And Jim Nolan had no eyes. I had gauzed out his eyes with stage makeup and gauze. 
And at the end of the play, I brought him to the well. And he pulled back, put his hands up to his eyes, splashed imaginary water on his eyes, took away in his hand the two pieces of gauze and people in the pub. He can see. Mad I, I, I did understand the, the spectacle, the magic, the things behind it, and we didn't know any better. We genuinely thought that when we were doing Yates, that everyone was doing Yates, but they weren't. When I actually did the research, we might have been the only people ever in Waterford to have done Yates in the pub. <laughs> how, how I, I, don't mean that I, ask, I don't mean that I expect praise for it, I don't. How stupid, how nutty, how daft you can become sometimes because it takes you over. Uh, I, was, uh, I remember being involved in lunchtime theatre in WDS, because Ted O'Regan was involved in lunchtime theatre, and the idea that we should be doing plays for tourists and we should be doing stuff, and we did Theresa Devey plays. And Theresa Devey was a Waterford playwright who was deaf and worked for the BBC at one time, and her work is produced now in America and the UK and has a greater revival outside of Waterford than it has in Waterford. It was only recently a plaque went on the wall for Theresa Devey in Waterford, you know? Uh, I, I hope, have I answered your question? I don't know, yeah? Uh, is there anything else you've written about people? Yeah, that's fantastic. So you get three minutes out of that, oh, fantastic. Can before you go, though? Right. Uh, can we get that shot with Liam again? Yeah. Just, like just, just to kind of get a sense of the place. I don't know if